I know where you can find 35 full sets. Start counting the ambulances on one trailer at the tent. And when you start pulling assets from the little general store, they had assets down there, but that was a few. If you have an asset station, you're miles apart. Where's the mass casualty trailers? Princeton, Lewisburg, Charleston. There's a lot of counties. We need to pull that system together. We need to have a documented way. And I really think the state office needs to help the Dr. Mills coordinate that because when everything goes sour in the end, it will look at the providers who didn't provide us the service and they're going to look back and say nobody anticipated this. And with that, I think that when you bring this into play in the licensure part of it, there should be a checkoff section that says we have MCI equipment, we participated in drills. In addition to that, we require everybody to take the MCI training class, right, for research. But beyond that, where do we apply in the grand scheme? You have a bunch of people that understand triage, but after you triage them, what's going to take care of them definitively? What are we going to do with them? Where are the resources? Where is the coordination and the coverage maintained? And I brought that up with escape, and I think that's a pretty valid point. Does anybody agree or disagree? So we do have a plan within OEMS, correct? Right. And aren't agencies using that MCI plan when they're participating in the regional hospital exercises that have been going on through the HPP program? Well, we're starting a new exercise thing because I know down in our area they was using the vents. But is there an overall coordination of equipment and stuff? Unless what I'm looking at is pulling equipment and things that you don't readily have. Well, that's what the SMART system is. Right. Is The purpose for that is to coordinate those assets. Okay, is it being maintained? Yes. Okay. And we had a huge MCI uh, event two years ago, I think, two summers ago at Beckley Airport where there was a, plane, a couple of plane crashes and we had assets from the southern part of the state and military aircraft and Gary back, Health Net participated, and I mean, it went on all day. It was huge. So we're having them, but maybe we're just not announcing them. We need to communicate them out. Communicate them out better. Smart was used during the flooding as well, and it turned out very well. So maybe just reissuing a something on the website about it, um, letting them know that you know, we do have this in plan, this plan in place and this is how you, you know, we allocate the equipment and things of that nature. Good. Is there any other questions on that? Do you have any comments? Do you have any other comments on that, Jim? No, I, you know, I just think it's really something we need to look at down the road because all it takes is one idiot. When you have a planned event, everybody kind of knows about it ahead of time. But at 3 o'clock in the morning, we need to call up a bunch of equipment. That, that's when the rubber really meets the road. It's, it's hard enough to cover a large traffic accident, much less something in a rural area. We can get um, reminders out of the smart system and how to use it. Mutual <coughs> agreements with the neighbors. Is right. it like all EMS agencies planning for? Are all EMS agencies mm -hmm. reporting for? Well, should be. Are they required to? Mm -hmm. I think so. Mm -hmm. um, Do we have data on that? Data on? Who's actually reporting? In SMART? Yeah. I'll, I'm sure we can get that in. Just curious, because I mean, I'll 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 self-report. We never did. Yeah, Well, there was. I think he's probably not here. Yeah, there was a. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there was a. There was a but plan. Can we look and see. Yes, we can look and see. There was, there was a there was a plan for EMS agencies to be required to report weekly into Smart. I believe that that uh, plan was scuttled. I believe there is currently no requirement that EMS agencies 
report to SMART. There are agencies that are reporting to SMART, and yes, we can pull up the numbers of those who are doing it. There are agencies that have reported one or more times to SMART that may be doing it irregularly, but I don't believe that the uh, West Virginia Office of Emergency Medical Services requires agencies to report on a weekly basis. Well, we can check that. <laughs> when, uh, when, when a request for a what I would count it on and counter on the smart system and, and as an administrator, this is, this is kind of frustrating from my standpoint is I get the email that's going, you've not updated smart. Well, when I try to go in to update smart, I'm not listed as a, the official representative, um, so I cannot update it. Well, the official representative um, is our one of our directors well they're off doing other things and i'm sitting there looking at the email and it's like well i can update this but no i can't even though you know i am the official administrator so and 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 the person who is listed <laughs> as the um, person to report right. is set by the agency in smart so that can you can change that that is your agency can change uh, who has the ability to log in and who has the ability to report. And also, again, who receives the emails is listed in SMART by your agency. Everybody's clear on that? And I'll see if I can get that changed so we can actually get an update. When the email went out for the flooding, there was very good return. Yes. Uh, a lot of agencies reported back in with what assets they had available to help out in the area. Uh, that was affected so the system works even if they weren't doing regular reporting when the uh, when the balloon went up a lot of folks uh, took out the BB guns and took a shot at the balloon so it was good stuff yeah but uh, let me clarify I am not saying that EMS agencies aren't more than willing to uh, to help out in an emergency and to do whatever they need to absolutely they do and they are and anything I said against that is wrong um, and a comment was made that you would have mutual aid with your surrounding agencies. The only thing I want to caution everybody here on, I'll get you in one second, um, is I know personally we had all these outlying agencies as our backup. Well, and then when we had the big disaster, <coughs> the other agency beat us to the jump, they called them they got the other squads, so then that put us going even further out, a couple of counties out to get other people, which we already <coughs> were going out to, you know, but, um, so just make sure you have multiple, like in several counties away, and you you allow for that time. Um, so with that being said, yes sir. How can medical men get access to the smart system? I have no idea. How can medical command get access to the smart system? You will have to look into that. my understanding that their uh, supervisors at MedCom did have access to SMART. That may not be true. If that's not true, then we'll... We were always told that we were not able to be deemed an agency and we could not have access. Yeah, uh, certainly, I mean, it's true that you would not have agency uh, level access because you're not an agency. The question is whether you would have management level access. You know, one of the things with the triage tags that we're currently using up, and when that was developed, we had to peel off barcodes to mark patient belongings and different things. And the initial plan was to have a barcode scanner at each regional command area to be sent out to use in the field. Whatever happened to that? Well, that would really do assist with you to keep the chain of evidence or something. Well, I mean, would it really matter? I mean, if 
just like in southern West Virginia, McDowell County is having a disaster. How was regional command supposed to get that barcode scanner to them? You but know that what I mean? One of the things they were going to put them in traditionally, so we'd have it. What does it just? What, what do you do? Work system allocated out. We can do the app. It all done at the same time. Right. Yeah, I, that's that was something that was brought up. Is is the smartphone apps, um, especially moving forward with the triage tags and uh, maybe getting the apps for that. If, just real quick, I, I work in uh, Northern Virginia. They have a huge um, mass casualty program they just rolled out. They just did the, uh, the training for it. Um, they filmed a, a training program on it. It does exactly what you're talking about. Um, medical command centers can log in and see what hospitals can take how many patients and what acuity. Um, and you can scan the barcodes and tell exactly where the patient is in the process. So rather than West Virginia try to reinvent the wheel, um, it's already out there and it's not that far from us. If that's something you're interested in, um, I'm sure we can, can get you the contacts for that. But it's an iPad um, <coughs> based program. Yeah. 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 I, I so that was one of the things yeah. years ago that the neighbor of states, like six different states, all worked together. Remember, when we did that, so we crossed state lines, like in our case, there would be no problem. <coughs> Pediatric safety. Um, this is a uh, very complex issue. Um, the research I've done on it, it's a lot of what ifs. Um, we're still actively working on it. Um, I'm bringing Vicki in because she's the expert in pediatrics. Whether she wants to admit it or not, she is. Because nobody else would do it. <laughs> <laughs> you do the job very, very well. Um, and she's brought up some um, things that she would like to present for the safety subcommittee to review and work on. So I'm going to let her speak on that. Some of these have been here or probably on my desk for two or three years or longer. Um, one of the things that I started many years ago was we wanted to do a brochure or a flyer um, to try to educate the public. And we thought we'd start by educating kids so that they grow up to adults that have a different mindset. Marsha. <laughs> um, so we wanted to develop like a flyer or a pamphlet of when to call, when to call 911, when to call an ambulance. Um, we used, we, when I started this, we used what another state had developed, and I don't, I think it was North Dakota, uh, but as Melissa and I talked uh, probably a month or so ago, what we would like to do is develop it into a, a little training program so that you guys can take it out into the field and take it into the schools and do it at safety events and just to try to, like I said, change the mindset of our future adults. <laughs> um, that was one program. Another one that we talked about doing um, was a voter safety. I think it was a, last year, year before we had an issue with some folks, some kids killed on, in a boating accident. Um, and one that I really would like to see happen <laughs> is on um, heat strokes in kids. Um, how we educate the public, don't lock your baby in a car. Don't leave your baby in a car. <laughs> Seems simple, but I think it's about every seven to eight days we lose a baby to being locked and left in a car. Um, I know there's, there's different tools out there, you know, as with any good tool, it costs money. Like there's thermometers you can get to put on the, the side glass of the car to show the reminder of the parents that there's a baby in the car, but here's how hot the car is right now. Um, that one, I mean, we lost two in Texas yesterday. Yesterday or day before yesterday. No, that was totally mother's fault. <laughs> She was partying in a bar and left the kids in there for 15 hours. But we're having them, they're leaving them in cars, forgetting them when they go to work. So that was just, that's three of our topics that we're looking at. And as far as the, where's Jeff? Um, we talk about the safe transport of kids. Um, I, we are 
We are actually working with uh, HPP, and we got some grant funding, 40000 and we're going to be able to purchase some, what are those called? Yeah, I get them wrong. Quantum ACR child restraint system. ACR. It's a four point harness, and where the PD mate is limited to 40 pounds, this will, this is four pounds to 99 pounds. So it's a wider range, bigger children. Yeah, you can PD's do a lot 10 more. to 40. You can, you can strap them to a backboard, you can strap them just to the cot, different positions. It's, it's just a much more versatile tool than the PD mate. You know, I'll be able to get as much as 40,000 we'll buy. So it may be one per agency, but that's, that's one that you didn't have. How much are they? They're about three hundred nineteen dollars a piece, or eight hundred for a four pack. Yeah. So with the and the P were about order. that, weren't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were like two two fifty each, something like that. That's it. That's all I have. So as far as the session mm -hmm. goes, I really, especially considering what we're working on. Um, in the time constraint, um, heat stroke. I, I don't want West Virginia to make the national news to have a child die from that. So I want to put that like on a high priority with us. So for all of you that are on the subcommittee, I'll be getting with you first and next week. Can I make a suggestion for the safety subcommittee? Absolutely. Um, can we just, well, I don't know what the options are for public outreach, but there, there's been a rash of pediatric ATV and UPV incidents. If we could, uh, you know, some kind of public education outreach to, to, to help with that. There used to be a program out there, but it's been a few years, and then we had the decrease. So the Hatfield McCoy Trust System had a program that they would go into the schools. Now I don't know if they did it statewide or they just did the southern part of the state. Well, that's what I'm wondering, if there could be a statewide program that you could kind of coordinate or develop that would be available to squads if they could get into the schools in the spring, you know, before summer or something, to try to, you know, sometimes if we had a package program, maybe we could get into some of the schools or some of those organizations and try to, or, or then if there's PSAs where maybe the local agency with that local newspaper could take something from the state and you could get several different ones and then they could put their flavor on it with and maybe you know the, the volunteer squad of this area is really wanting you to you know with a picture or something on the front i think a lot of psa's you know in the news they could start to do something where they go you know if you want to get out to the local news or a newspaper or something get an interview or something like that maybe you could gather that and send it out as packets that we could kind of use and say, all right, this is some talking points we could use out there. To and when I first came on the board in this job, there was a video that was produced called A Trip Unplanned. It was produced with, I believe, the state of Arkansas. I um, remember that. That was years ago. It's an okay video. Yeah. But it, it, it's, a, it's a video. <laughs> but there were some things in it that I didn't, I didn't care for. Um, like the, the gun safety factor was an issue that I had an issue with just certain things in the video that I would not have put in it. Um, Thank you. Tip yeah. with Jessica Wright with rural uh, community prevention, whatever, and our BPH school program because they may already have something that we okay. can partner with them on or expand. BPH school program? Yeah, I've got her name back up for a call. So okay. Get it to you. And Dr. Mills, I don't know if, I should know, but in the athletic, right, they're talking about if you have a heat stroke with the athletes that now they're supposed to be in ice water for 15 minutes, or at least that seems to be what's hitting the national news. If there was a baby in the, you know, and they have not succumbed or they're not deceased yet, I have not seen where they said, you know, take the baby out of the car if they're still alive, because they're saying that, you know, if the temperatures above 105, 106, then you know obviously they're just they're having brain damage as you go and you gotta have an immediate cool down. What well, we were trying to figure out about the athletes about what you could do with an ambulance if we're covering football games for instance or you know sporting events. And what we have is we have body bags. We don't have kiddie pools, we don't have tanks, we don't have anything else. But if you had a body bag that you held open so it holds water and you dumped in all the Gatorade that both teams had you know, the ice Gatorade or water, whatever they have, well then you could do that cooling down. They were saying it's usually 15 minutes if someone's in a heat stroke 
to try to get their temperature below 103 or 2. I don't know if that's for the babies or not. I don't know if you've ever seen, because I haven't really seen anything about that, but I'm wondering if from a protocol standpoint between the athletic sports venue and that heat stroke about a rapid cooling scenario, if there is a way, I don't think we can put a new system in place, but it would be something. And the only thing I like about the body bag is every truck already has one. So it's not an expense, it's just the idea that if you can get access to water or ice that they're talking about that rapid cooling, that maybe we, they could look at that and get the kids and the athletes and the occasional adult that would be some way of doing it. Because you don't have to transport them in ice water, you're basically supposed to cool them down. Um, could we ask Dr. Melroy? What's that? Dr. Yeah. Yeah. Melroy right. from WVU, we ask you. Perfect. Vicki, will he be here tomorrow? Do you know? No. He is not. He will not be here tomorrow. Vicki, one of the things that I think works really well, and I still use stuff in our PR program, was to save kids because it was non copyrighted material that we could recopy and put our logo on. That's been out for years, but that was a really good system. It was a broad base, and we could include the new stuff out there. And that way it gives the squad something, they can go to the copy machine, run it off, and we got information that immediately give the kids. Yeah, and we were also trying to get information out about safe kids to agencies um, because there was so much money out there. It may be $250 out of pop, but you could name one station, let's say it's Sharple Station. Um, you were safe kids, Sharples. And so every time you could sh indicate that this was a safe kids location, you could uh, start applying for little mini grants. And it's not like grants like what I'm used to writing. It's, it was just tiny one sheet flyer things. Um, but you could do that if you had a whole county. You know, every county can do that multiple times. We were trying to get information about that out. The problem was there's been a lot of turnover in the position because that's run through uh, violence and injury prevention at the state level, um, maternal child and family health. And so there's been a lot of turnover there. So we lost that consistency. We were just getting ready to get it out. Yeah, and that, they lost a couple people. So. Yeah, and you actually get your logo and stuff to use yeah. from there. Yeah, we still use it. Okay. Is there anything else on that? Okay. Um, we have another. That was a kudos to the state because if you think about it as a squad, the one thing the state would give you for free is the kids stuff. I mean, you really think about it. And it's, you would, whenever Vicky came up, you had to fill out those dang forms. <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, you you were able to get a lot of things out. The PD mates, there was a lot of very solid, life-changing things that went out to squad. Easy IOs. Easy IOs from the kids' grants. So and those that those happened from having a conversation in a in at an elevator. Yeah. Honestly, that's how I got that money. So, I mean, that, that's outstanding work, and that's really something to remember because we're still utilizing a lot of those things that were brought out. So. Yeah, Vicki was one of the few from the state whenever they called or yeah, they showed did. up, hey. they were excited. That's so mean. Uh, uh, yeah, I used to have to preference. I'm one of the good ones. <laughs> I can't believe folks say that anymore. But and, and finally, <laughs> that long report, which I didn't necessarily like, that that big questionnaire about training. What is going to be the outcome of that? Because they asked a lot of very pointed questions. That it, it has to, to do with two performance measures that they're they're measuring. Um, I believe it was the pediatric training. Right. Do you have a person that's assigned to it and? Oh, I wish I had my book. What was the second one? Was it Nemesis? There's, it's two, it has to do with two. Um, but there was a new, lot of. And they're new performance measures. Right. We just, they just started them this year. Right. So the, it's basically to get a baseline to see where all the agencies are. Um, it, all the data goes back to Utah, and at some point I'll get a report. But it won't probably be, it'll be several months because it, they've got to complete it nationwide first. And we were just in the first cohort. So there was a bunch of information in there that yeah. opportunity for looking at this. Sherry calls those opportunities for improvement. Yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, the next item is 
fentanyl, EMS, and law enforcement safety issues? I brought that up as a possible talking point. They just released yesterday the DA. You know, I think I sent out to, to my agency and I was sitting there going, so I've lived through the AIDS of the 80s, then there was the meth labs, then there was you know, the crack, and then there was the PCP, and then there was anthrax that was gonna kill everybody. So I don't know if this is the next thing or just gonna be a little bump and we go down the road. But the problem I'm seeing with fentanyl that really made sense to me is that it's manufactured in China uh, from precursors from here or Mexico, and they can ship a kilo Right? So there is no growing the tree, there is no poppy fields, there is no coca trees, there is no putting it in somebody's bowels and getting them on the airplane. But this stuff basically just gets shipped from China to somebody's address. They open it up and one kilo is worth about $10 million because it's so concentrated. And it's basically lightweight. So it could spread. And then of course if you get the dust and all that stuff, then you could end up with, with officers going down. I don't know as far as EMS and law enforcement how far we go with it. They are talking about PPE, which we have on the ambulances, which is the N95 mask. They are talking about the paper gowns, which we do have some gowns and stuff there. We're just doing, I mean, we give out four naloxins a day on average now, or 4.15 or whatever it is, doses. And the number of doses are going up per person and the number of people that we're treating are going up. It seems like it's rising. I don't know whether the state or anybody really needs to have it. There is a good form and I can get that information out there. It's a 20 page document. What it is is that it's very cheap to manufacture. It's going to be around a while. There is no clandestine thing. It's going to be hard to shut down. And the fact that they just now cutting it with everything because it's cheaper and easier to move than getting stuff from Afghanistan or anywhere else. So that's really why it's here. Because I couldn't figure out why fentanyl is something there. So it's not a pill that was prescribed by a doctor. It's just, it's, it's now just whatever they make. There's 20 versions of it. So I don't know if people have run into challenges. We put out word about wearing gloves, be more aware of it. I don't know if it rises to the level of a protocol or just a thing that goes out. I don't know if we did it on every overdose, we'd be all geared up for a thousand of them that we wouldn't need. But I do think you need to understand that it is out there in about every state around us has had law enforcement officers that's had Narcan. Um, pushed by EMS. So that's it. It's the next blip on the screen and the fact that it's just killing a lot more people. So, you know, our deaths in overdose of opiates are now 33,000 and car wrecks is 40, 38,000 or something. It's almost as many dying of opiate overdose, opiate alone, than car wrecks, which is pretty phenomenally ridiculous in this country. But um, anyway. I've read in one state, I think it was Maryland, um, where they're requiring their ambulances to carry Narcan just for the ambulance personnel. Right. That way if they come in contact with the carpet and things like that. So I had um, a meeting with Dr. Mills and Melissa uh, last week to discuss this very topic. Uh, because I've got police departments calling all the time, what do we do with this? You know, what are we supposed to do if we get exposed? And uh, what are we looking at? The, the law enforcement agencies are not well educated. And what we're finding is they're getting a lot of information from a ton of different sources. And some of that information really uh, is obscure and, and, and way off base from what they really need to be concerned about. And uh, you know, they, they shared some of that with me and I'm looking at them like, you know, this just doesn't seem factual to me. I mean, some of the literature they're getting is saying that, you know, the law enforcement officers are going down every hour yeah. and being exposed to this. That's not factual. Okay, but this is the information that our law enforcement people are getting. So uh, what I've asked is that uh, Dr. Mills and Melissa develop some type of fact sheet uh, from the Office of EMS to get out to our state, uh, to law enforcement and to EMS. Uh, and actually, right after uh, we talked, the Department of Justice put out this booklet, uh, which still has some things that may be questionable, but it's a good start. Um, and it walks through what fentanyl is, it walks through how it's produced, it walks through the exposure risk. You know, this thing gets into the full encapsulated suits to deal with it. And, you know, maybe if you were dealing with a truckload of it, but, uh, you know, so, so it goes a little maybe beyond what, what we actually want to get out there, but it's a good starting point. So I have a couple of these if anybody wants to see them, but I think this may be a good model for you to look at 
and uh, developing something to put out for the state. Well, Dr. Mills has done some, some research since we had our conversation, and policeone.com has a great one pager. It's five things to do understand that fentanyl can kill you, know that fentanyl is transdermal, wear proper protective gear, do not field test suspected fentanyl, and implement a naloxone program in your agency. So we'll probably just build off of that and get something out. And Bob, don't we have that book posted on our news alert section? I think I forwarded that from Jimmy Jeanette last week and it was posted. Sorry, I didn't remember. I know. Maybe I one of the things that may be a very good source of information is we had our drug task force come in and provide classes to all our personnel mm -hmm. down there. He was a wealth of information of exactly what they're seeing on the street. Some things our people have questions do pop in, as well as the heroin packaging and things to look for in vehicles when we're car wrecks and things. And that might be one place you can turn to look because they have up to date information. They even had a website that we'd heard about that, that where to cook the stuff and the best ways to get high, you know, other games. And our task force seems to have a lot of that information. Where, where the our task force is struggling is what do they do if they get exposed or how do they prevent yeah. getting exposed? And if they want to collect evidence that's loose and on the counter, how do they do it and protect ourselves? They don't have that. They don't have it. The DEA has a video out on their website that has two officers on there and they just close the baggies to, to expel the air and blow it up. And they both went down, but it has a little bit of a factual thing as well. It's a resource. Right. No, I've got a, a two-page, it came from Maryland, and it's just kind of a, a first responder reference, so I can get that to you too. The only thing I found that was interesting in this booklet was they said that now a lot of them are in nasal sprays where they're taking, you know, and so they're actually liquefying it, and so now that little ch -ch -ch that they can carry around their pocket is the way they're inhaling it. Um, which I had not heard of. That was the one thing I had not heard of before is that that's what they're doing is dropping some of it in and then they're, so it, that's what's kind of unique about it versus the cocaine and everything else is just how many ways you can absorb it and how small, you know, the particles really are and stuff. So I think that partly is just more of an update scenario of just saying pinpoint pupils and a cop and they can start to go down and burn your partner then you need to arc them up. Is there anything else on this? If not, I'm going to finish this session out. A couple minutes early. Any comments, suggestions? This meeting's adjourned.